All right, so hi everyone. I am Connie Zabel-Schmucker. I'm Advocacy Director at Bicycle Garage Indy. And one of the things that I do as part of my job is um, provide bicycle safety education or bicycle education. And about 10 to 12 years ago, um, I found out that there were people that didn't know how to ride bikes. And um, people of all ages, and that that was something um, that was a need. Um, so I did quite a bit of research. My very first bike riding student was an adult, and she had tried to ride when she was young, um, but had a traumatic experience, um, ran into a wall with the bike, and so she never wanted to get on the bike again. Um, but now as an adult and the mother of a six-year-old, she wanted to be able to learn how to ride a bike so she could ride with her daughter. And so I had never taught anybody how to ride a bike from the beginning before um, because most bike riding um, training that I had, I'm a league cycling instructor um, certified by the League of American Bicyclists. But all of the bicycle safety and bicycle education programs assume that somebody already knows how to ride a bike. So there wasn't a whole lot of um, information about how to teach somebody, let alone how to teach an adult how to do it. So um, I did find some resources and um, did some, she was my experiment and I got her riding, which was really exciting. It's always fun to see someone ride for the first time and see the biggest smile on their face. It's really, it's really, really rewarding. Um, so of course, I, you know, last year I did not have any private or group bike riding lessons because of the pandemic. Um, I am hoping to start those next month, but as you can imagine, I actually have a big waiting list from last year. So. Um, but I also believe that parents, if they could, would really rather teach their children how to ride bikes. Um, and I usually get the hard cases because parents have already tried to teach and haven't been as successful as they would like. And so they're looking for somebody to, to um, help. Um, or I get adults who, for some reason, never learned and um, either um, didn't have the opportunity or had some bad experience when they were young, but now they're, they're more motivated to, to learn. So um, the good news is that the, you can learn pretty much at any age. I've taught somebody as young as four and a half and I've taught somebody as old as 70 years old and everything in between. Um, the key things are a motivated student and somebody who is, is brave and um, brave and fearless, and if they're if they're not fearless, hopefully brave, because usually a lot of times they're tentative, and one of the reasons why they're so tentative um, is because they're scared of falling um, or scared of getting hurt, and so we do a lot of things to try and mitigate that and um, address their fears. So I wanted to start, let me see, I'm going to go into full frame for this. And so I wanted to show a couple videos of some of my students. Um, these videos are also up on the Bicycle Garage Indies Learn to Ride page and Streetwise page. Um, this, I think this first one is of Neville, and this is after he's learned how to ride and his mom sent me this, this, um, sent me this nice video of him. This is where he's going down his driveway and turning onto the street and going off for a nice bike ride. And so it's always gratifying to see students who are 
riding because a lot of times once I get them pedaling, I never see them again. So it's neat to see that they're actually out riding. So this next one is an adult bike rider. And this was done um, 45 minutes after she came for her first lesson. So this is 45 minutes into her first lesson. And she was one of my, my good, good riders who learned pretty quickly. Um, and she was, she was excited. She didn't think that she would get that far in her first lesson. So that was, that was really fun. Um, this next one, this is Micaiah and her grandfather had been trying to teach her how to ride and they lived fairly far away and um, he didn't really think they could come from multiple lessons. So I talked with him over the phone and gave him some tips on how to get her um, coasting first. And so she was able to coast before I saw her, which was really good. That, that's the hardest step. And so this is 15 minutes into her lesson. She was already pedaling. And then we had to work on you know, stopping and starting and getting the seat higher up and, and things like that. But that was you know 15 minutes into her first lesson, but that was because she already knew how to coast ahead of time. And then this last one is Olivia. And I don't know if you can hear the, I don't know if I can get the sound on. But her mom is like cheering her on. Um, she's right here, if you can see that. And she's in this big parking lot. And Olivia, prior to this day, um, we had been working on trying to get her to pedal. She almost had it, but she would she would just start and then all of a sudden stop pedaling um, and then just put the brakes on and we just couldn't get her to continue riding. Um, and so this was a big, huge breakthrough that she was um, able to ride and did a big circle in this big parking lot. And I, um, she and her mom are my poster child and mother for the um, for the promotion of this clinic and learned to ride classes. And I asked her mom, you know, I called her up and asked her if I could use their their photo that she sent me in this video that she sent me. And she said, oh yes. And Olivia is, she says that Olivia thinks of her bike riding lessons a lot and that bicycling is her favorite activity to do. And so that's really heartwarming for me to hear. I don't always um, know, like I said, once somebody learns how to pedal, usually the parents or the adults say, okay, I've got it from here. And I don't always see them or, or learn what they've done after that. So it was really neat to hear that that was, you know, bicycling is one of her favorite activities. Let's see, so, one of the things that we do is set up for success. Um, so, and I can't really see the chat stuff very easily. So if you do have um, questions in the chat, um, go ahead and, and unmic yourself as well. Just, it's not showing up really easily for chat. Um, so, you know, riding a bike can be really fun. And once you learn how to ride a bike, it's a lot of fun. Um, there's some steps involved and some, um, some hard work involved. And most of the time, it's mainly that um, the student is fearful of falling or fearful that they can't do it. Um, and so, you have to try and overcome their fear. Um, so we're gonna talk about how we configure the bike for practice and where the best place to practice bike riding lessons and then um, the, best, the best bike and how to separate balancing, pedaling and stopping because those are all skills that you build upon. And then you need to really watch for frustration. So, I usually teach in about half hour 
lessons, especially the first lesson. If somebody hasn't gotten uh, coasting very well in the first lesson after a half an hour, then I'm just going to get end up getting diminishing returns. They're just going to get more and more frustrated. And so usually I start saying, you know, they're almost there, but not quite. They know enough to know how to practice it. And then they'll come back after they've mastered that skill. And then we'll We'll continue on with the next skills, but everything builds off of coasting and gliding. And so that's that's the, the key thing to get down. Once they can do that, pedaling is super easy. And in fact, once they're pedaling, I can't get them to stop pedaling so that we can practice starting and stopping. So, um, which are key things as well. But, you know, so we work on balancing first and then we add pedals at a time, which are success. Um, you want to celebrate lots of little teeny successes along the way so that they feel like they're accomplishing stuff. Um, when I see them multiple times, I almost always have them go over the skills that they did before just to make sure that they remember how to do all of that and that we're building on skills that they've mastered already. Let's see, do the next one. So setting up the bike. Um, I like to use bikes slightly smaller than what they need. Um, I like to use bikes that have hand brakes versus coaster brakes. And um, it's helpful to take the pedals off. You want the, the seat to be all the way down as far as, as you can so that their feet are flat on the ground when they're sitting on the seat. That is for learning purposes, not for riding later. But for learning purposes, we want to make sure that they have firm feet because they're going to be using their feet to propel themselves as well as catching themselves when when they're going from side to side so um and it's helpful to take the pedals off so they're out of the way and those can serve as milestones and incentives um, when they get to add a pedal they get to add the second pedal it's a big huge milestone um, and the rider should wear tennis shoes and comfortable clothing. The, the pants that they wear um, should be fairly close at the ankles or put some kind of rubber band around their ankles so that the material doesn't get into the chain. Um, and tennis shoes um, are good because you want to make sure that they have a rubber sole and they can push off very easily with that. Um, I once had a couple students that actually came with flip-flops. Flip-flops are not good to learn in, um, so they, they really need to be, be tennis shoes. Um, let's see. So this is this, what it looks like for a seat position for learning to bike. So you can see the seat is right there and his feet are flat on the ground and he's not reaching too far for the handlebars. And this particular bike also has hand brakes. Um, then you want to figure out a good location for bike riding lessons and bike riding practices. So um, look for a quiet parking lot, one that doesn't have a lot of activity, um, you know, a church or a school on weekends or in the evenings usually is pretty good or some business um, that's a daytime business that doesn't have a lot of activity. And you look for slight downhills. Um, one, one of the easiest ways to find a slight downhill is you look for the drains in the parking lot and there will be a downslope towards the drains. It doesn't need to be a very big um, downhill, but it's easier to learn if there's a slight downhill when they're starting. Uh, let's see. Um, and if you remember, the big parking lot that Olivia was riding in, that, that's a perfect parking lot. So the first thing I have them do is to, um, after we have put their helmet on and adjusted that, um, we walk with the bike. So both hands on the handlebars have their body kind of close to the, closer to the handlebars in the seat and walk the length of the parking lot down the down slope and I, I'll say break and I want them to break with the hand, hand brakes. I'll cover a little bit with coaster brakes later, um, but this is assuming that 
they have handbrakes on their bike and not coaster brakes um, and not training wheels. So they're walking the length of parking lot. I say brake and then they should use their hands to put on the brakes. And you do that a couple of times. And so I have them use the right brake on the way down the hill um, or down the down slope. It's not really a hill. And the uh, left brake goes for the front wheel. Um, you should only use the right brake by itself or both brakes. If you use the left brake, which is the front wheel, and you just stop the front wheel and the rest of it doesn't, um, that's, you could potentially tip over front forward. It's not, they're not going to be going very fast. So most of the time I just have them use the rear brake. Um, but if you use both brakes, or if you want to use the left brake, it needs to be with both. Um, a lot of times uh, a bike with 20 inch wheels will start having handbrakes. If they're smaller than that, like I know there's a seven year old here, uh, a seven year old child, um, that bike might not have handbrakes, depends on how big the child is. So about 20 inch, wheel size, um, kids bikes are in wheel size. So they go 12, 16, 20, 24. Um, and then you get into adult sizes and adult size bikes are by frame size, not by, by wheel size. So um, if it just has one handbrake, it's most likely the rear wheel. Um, let's see what's next. Okay, so the next thing I do, um, I added this step because I was having people get, get on and off the bike um, too quickly and they'd get tripped up on the bike um, and there is a safe, safer way to get on and off the bike. So we don't get on and off the bike all that often when we go on bike rides. We get on the bike um, to start riding and when we have stop signs, we don't get off the bike we just get off the seat and put our feet down and get ready to pedal again. Um, and we don't really get off the bike until we get to our destination. However, during bike riding lessons, they are getting on and off the bike a lot. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that they know how to do it safely and wouldn't have any issues with that. So to get on the bike, you wanna stand close to the handlebars with the hands on the handlebars and put the brakes on so the, br the bike doesn't move, then you can kind of lean toward, lean against that resistance. So it's a little bit more stable. And then I have them swing whatever leg is closest to the bike, swing it over the back seat and stand in front of this. So they end up standing in front of the seat. Um, so they're standing between the seat and the handlebars. To get off the bike, um, you wanna make sure that the bike is stable, it's straight up and down, you've got the brakes on, and then you swing a leg over, so then you end up with both legs on one side of the bike. Um, there is a photo of that. In this photo, um, I also, when they're doing that, I'll put my hand on the handlebars just to make sure that the bike is relatively stable and the, the front wheel isn't gonna move. Um, but I like to have both of their hands on the handlebars. And this youth only has one hand on the handlebars, but I would, I would have him have both on the handlebars and also have the brakes on. If you notice, the brakes aren't on as, as well. So those are the things. Um, so we practice that going on and off the bike, um, mounting and dismounting it, um, just so they get used to that. Because during bike riding lessons, I'm having them go one way, um, working on coasting and then stopping, getting off the bike and walking it back. And so there's a lot of on and off, off the bike that you don't have in normal bike riding experiences. All right, so then the big thing, so right now they haven't done anything other than walk with the bike, use the brakes and get on and off the bike. They actually haven't sat on the bike with it moving. So now we're getting to the actual pushing off and coasting, which is the key for learning how to ride a bike. So I have them sit on the bike 
and the, the seat is low enough so that they can put their feet flat on the ground on either side. Um, and then they push off with both feet. So um, like here, and they have to really push off a lot as if you're scraping mud off the bottom of your shoes, you should hear something. Um, uh, before they do that, you need to make sure the bike is straight and the rider is looking straight ahead and up at some object in front. And I usually count off and say, okay, one, two, three, go, or one, two, three, push. Um, and their goal, the goal is to keep the feet up as long as possible. Now you're doing this on a slight downslope. So hopefully once they push off, they'll get a little bit of the momentum. Momentum is your friend. So if you don't have enough momentum with your big push, your first push, the bike's not gonna go very far. It's gonna be really wobbly. Um, and, and so I tell them, you know, when the bike it gets too wobbly, then you just put on the brakes and you put your feet down. The reason why we have the seat down so that your feet can be flat on the ground is so you can put your feet down to catch yourself. But I want them to use the brake first and then put their feet down because later on when they're riding, you don't want them to put their feet down first and then put the brakes. So it's always brakes first, then feet down. Um, so a lot of times they'll want to look down at their feet or down at, at the front wheel. They really need to be looking out forward. Um, you know, so if you have a person standing out there or some object that they can focus on um, in the back parking lot at BGI where I do the lessons, we have these big yellow um, poles. And so I, I tell them to look at the yellow poles. You want to make sure the bike is straight, the wheel is straight, that they're focused where they're, where they're headed. Now, sometimes um, some people, uh, other teachers will do a walking. So they'll go step, step, you know, with each foot. I tend to do both feet at the same time because I've found that that propels them more straight. Whereas if you do one foot, at, one foot at a time, a lot of times the bike will shift from side to side. So, but I have done this. Sometimes it's harder for people to do um, the both feet at the same time. So I'll um, then do the walking, um, this, this kind of coasting and gliding as well. So, what should you be looking for when they're gliding or coasting? What you want them to do is have enough momentum that they can go five feet and then put on the brakes, put their feet down and then work to get 10 feet and then work to get 20 feet. Once they get 20 feet and they start feeling what the balance is and they can usually easily go 30 and 40 feet after that. Um, a lot of times, if you don't have a, uh, much of a downhill um, and they don't push off hard enough, then they don't get enough momentum to be able to balance. They're going to be too wobbly at the beginning. Slow speeds are the least stable when you're on the bike. So you want to make sure that you have enough momentum. And so sometimes at, at BGI, we have a covered deck and there's a, a more of a downhill um, going, going towards the dirt track for mountain bike test rides. And so sometimes I'll take them over there so they get a feeling of a little bit more speed if they're not getting that on the other, um, on the other very slight downhill slope. Um, so at this point, usually once we've worked on starting to get coasting done. Um, they, a lot of times they're fearful, so they don't push off very far. And so I have to say, you have to be really brave and you know, be fearless. Um, so they, because the faster they go, the more stable the bike gets. And that's a really hard thing when somebody's scared, they want, to go slower because I think if they're very careful, they won't fall down. And so it's hard to get beyond that psychological barrier sometimes. 
So you sometimes just, you know, they have to eventually feel what, what it means to actually have a good coast. And after about 10 to 15 minutes of working on coasting, um, a lot of times I'll be able to tell that they know when they had a good start and a bad start. And then we work on trying to have better starts, you know, so more power, more, you know, really push harder. Um, and if I can get them to about 10 feet in the first lesson and they're kind of getting tired because it is hard work, um, then I'll say, okay, you know what it feels like to have a good coast and bad coast. So work on the really good coast and then show, show me next time how, how you can, you know, how you can coast really well. So what I'm looking for is at least 30 or 40 feet of coasting with one push. Now, sometimes what they'll do is they'll push off and they'll start losing momentum and then they could push off again and continue getting momentum. And eventually they'll start feeling what the momentum, what a good momentum is to continue their coast. Um, so key to learning balancing on the bike is a lot of times if they're leaning one way, then that's the way that they need to turn the front wheel. Um, and if they're leaning another, if they tend to lean to the left then they need to turn the wheel to the left to bring it back, to bring the bicycle back under them. Um, so I had some students who did U-turns. I had one, one woman who, I, it didn't matter where I started her in the parking lot, she would do a U-turn and come back. Some of my students do the best U-turns. I can't do U-turns as well as some of them. Um, but you have to be going really slow to be able to do a U-turn. So that what that means is if they're doing a lot of turns, that means they're not getting enough forward momentum. So that's one of the things, um, you know, if it's really wobbly, that means they're not getting enough speed. If they're doing a lot of turns or a lot of zigzags, that means they're not getting enough forward momentum. Um, but it's okay if they're doing, you know, doing zigzags and they're keeping on going and they're, um, you know, eventually they're going to lose momentum because all we're doing is pushing off with our feet, with their feet. And so they're eventually the bike is going to slow down. And that's when they need to put the brakes on and put their feet down. Um, because we don't have, um, we don't have pedals to get us going farther. Once we add pedals, then they have choices. They have a choice if they're getting wobbly, then they pedal faster or they stop pedaling and they put on the brakes and stop. So, but prior to having pedaling, they just have one option. If it starts to get wobbly, then they put the brakes on and put their feet down. All right, so we're gonna assume that this, the rider has coasted 40 feet with one push and it's time to pedal. Um, I wanna go back actually. So when they're coasting, you need to celebrate every single small victory as they're coasting. Coasting is the hardest thing to that they're going to learn. And everything is based on the fact that they can coast well. So, you know, if they've gotten five feet, if they've gotten 10 feet, um, I, I used to do high fives. I probably won't be able to do that when once I start the lessons again, um, but I can probably do ring, ringing of bells or something like that. Um, but you want to have some victory for each success along the way. That was a great coast. You did awesome. Got to work on your stop. So, you know, there's always, always something, you know, to work on as well. But, you know, give them as much praise as possible. Um, so when I add a pedal, um, this is assuming you've taken off the pedals. If you can't get the pedals off, then put like a sock or a koozie on the pedal so that when hopefully when they're pushing off with their feet, the pedals often will get in the way. So they might hit their leg on the pedal. And so it's best if there's some cushion for that. If you can take off the pedals, that's that's even better because then it's it's a incentive for them to be able to get the pedal back on. 
So how I choose um, which pedal to put on is if the rider is right-handed, I put the right pedal on for the first for the first pedal and left-hander, the left pedal goes on. Now, if you take the pedals off, um, the right is the right pedal um, screws in clockwise. So right, right is tight. The left pedal is the opposite. So it does it the opposite for the left pedal. So when you're putting them back on, you want to make sure that you don't strip, strip the pedals when you're putting them back in. Um, so what I have them do is we'll say it's the right, the right foot is on. So I put the pedal at six o'clock, so all the way down. And I will stand in front of the bike and stand with the handlebars, hold the handlebars, and they're on the seat. And all I want them to do is just look up at me and then find the pedal with their foot. I don't want them to stomp on it because that gives too much weight on that. I just want them to gently rest it on, on the pedal that's at six o'clock. So, so we practice that so they can find it because I don't want them to look down to find the pedal. I want them to find it with their foot. And then um, I'll have them start the same way they did with both feet pushing off. And then if they have a good coast going, I have them put rest their foot on the pedal. That's at, at six o'clock. Um, if they don't have a good coast going, and I tell them this, if you don't have a good coast going, don't worry about finding the pedal. But hopefully they do. And sometimes I'll yell out, pedal, pedal, um, for them to find the pedal. And um, so that's that's how we start with, with the pedal. So, and if they've had wobbly coasts before, having, you know, having their foot resting on the pedal and the weight of their leg on the pedal actually really does um, take some of that wobbliness out. Because if you can imagine, um, all of their weight prior to that has been on their seat and a little bit on their hands when they've been practicing coasting, which is why coasting, I don't like doing more than 20 minutes at a time because all of your weight is on, on your rear end and on the seat. And that is not all that comfortable sometimes. So you want to be able to have breaks or have, you know, work on it for like 20 minutes. And then if they don't have it by then, then try it another day, you know, so it, you don't have to have it all at, all at once. Um, but once they start putting their feet on the pedals, then they have the weight of their legs and some of their body on the pedals and not everything on the seat. So, so once they're able to do that and they're able to coast and then rest their foot on the pedal um, and then they stop, they slow down, they put their brakes on, put their feet down. Then we're ready to start with the pedal. Um, so right now we've still been pushing off with our feet, but now we're gonna start with the pedal. Um, so if, uh, if it's the right pedal that is on, that's gonna be the starter foot, then you place that pedal at two o'clock so that it's even with the down two. And I've got a picture in the next slide. And if it's the left pedal, then you also put it even with the down tube only. That's at 10 o'clock on the other side. Um, you have the rider sit on the seat and they place their left foot on the ground. This is assuming it's the right, right pedal. Left foot, so I kind of have them lean on their leg that's on the ground, that's solidly on the ground. And then they lift their other leg to put it on this pedal that's up at, at two o'clock. So now when, they, now when they start riding, they're going to push off with the ground with their left foot like they have been, but they're going to push down with the pedal with their right foot. Now, once the pedal gets all the way down to like six o'clock, then they're just gonna keep it there like they did in the previous step where they were just coasting with that foot because they can coast with their, their foot all the way down. So, um, so that's what, what we do so we get ready to start. Now, if the bike has gears, 
you want to make sure that it's in a fairly easy gear. If it's too easy of a gear, they're not going to get enough momentum with this pedal, pedal push. If it's too hard of a gear, then they're going to have to push too hard and their balance is going to get off at the beginning. So it has to be fairly easy. Now remember, we're on a slight down, down slope as well, so that helps. Um, so it's a little tricky um, to determine what the, what the good what the good gear is, depending on, on your downslope, but um, you want it to be in the middle, not too easy, not too hard to pedal. So this is a right foot starter pedal. This is the down tube right here, and the pedal is even with that. You don't want it all the way straight up. You want it about two o'clock or so, so that when they push down, when they have the they're, they're actually going to push for, push the bike forward. And that is called the power pedal position. And that's where pedals should be um, to start, whether you're just learning how to ride a bike or anytime you want to start. Um, so adding the second pedal, so once they can do that skill, um, then we start adding the second pedal. So you start, you, I add it. And we go over this um, before they actually start riding. Um, so they're going to start with their foot on the pedal as in the previous step. And when they're coasting and it's all the way down at six o'clock, then they need to find the other pedal with their other foot. And I want them to do that without looking, without looking down. So we practice that. Um, with me holding onto the handlebars and them just looking up and finding the pedal. Um, so once they've done that, I just want them to rest their foot at the top because it's going to be at 12 o'clock. On the other hand, then the other foot's going to be at six o'clock. So I just want them to rest their feet there, coast. And then when they come to a stop and they break, now I want them to step off the second pedal towards the handlebars. So their foot is up at 12 o'clock and now it's just gonna come down forward and they're gonna end up standing in front of the seat. Now, a lot of times, once the rider gets their second foot on the pedals, they start pedaling and um, I haven't taught them how to stop with both feet on the pedals and there are a couple steps in that. Um, but they usually at this point, they're like, oh, this is fun. I can pedal, um, which is great. But we have a couple more steps to do. So then, then we go through those. So once, um, once they have been pedaling, if they're wanting to stop after they've, you know, to come to a controlled stop, what I want them to do is put their starting pedal um, starting foot pedal, and we're going to assume that this is the right-handed person, so it'd be their right foot all the way down at six o'clock, like they did in the coasting step, and let the bike slow down, put the brakes on, and then step off with the other foot. Um, but you want it to be uh, all the way straight down, um, that starting foot, the, the pedal all the way straight down so that when they put their weight on that pedal and they're stepping off with the other foot that the bike doesn't continue going forward. So I always ask, okay, so now we're gonna stop. What are the, what's the first thing that you do when you stop? And everybody always says you put on the brakes. And that's actually not the first step. That's about, the third step of, of four. So the first thing you do is you stop pedaling. Um, so you don't wanna be pedaling and putting on the brakes. So you stop pedaling and you wanna stop pedaling so that the starting foot is in its coasting position, pedal straight down. And then when the bike slows down, then you apply the brakes, usually the right brake only. And sometimes if you're going fairly fast and you need to come to a, a quicker stop, then you put on both brakes. And when, then once the bike has stopped, that's when the non-starting foot gets ready to step off and step forward. And 
it can even get off the pedal and kind of dangle in front of the pedal while you're while you're coasting and and braking. Um, it can do that. So once once stopping and starting and pedaling have been learned, everybody loves pedaling, and they don't really like starting and stopping, but they really really need to practice how to start and how to stop. Um, so those are ingrained and they don't have to think about, think through all these steps. A lot of times when they're working, when they're pedaling and um, I'm going through the steps while they're riding of how to stop, then I'll often say, you know, right foot down and brake and step off. Um, you know, so that kind of ingrains into their head the different steps that they need to do. Um, and I often will give the assignment, you need to practice stopping and starting at least 100 times. And I really mean 100 times, not 10 times or 20 times. I really mean 100 so that it's second nature and they don't have to think about it. This is a great video I found from Locomotion, which is a place, it's an advocacy group in Vermont, Burlington, Vermont. And they have a great video on how to start and stop. So once we get through the ad, so I'm gonna play that. Hopefully you can hear it. We're doing getting on your bike, starting to pedal, and safely stopping. My video partner and avid biker, Skylar, is here with me to help demonstrate some techniques that will make starting and stopping a breeze. While getting on your bike might seem straightforward, it can be difficult if you have limited mobility or are uncomfortable lifting your leg over the top tube. But if you are uncomfortable getting on your bike, don't give up yet. There are some strategies you can use. You can lean your bike pretty far down to give yourself some clearance to step over. Once your leg is over, just lift your bike back up and you're on, ready to ride. Once you're on your bike, if you can't stand over the top tube with both feet flat on the ground, it's a sure sign that your bike is too big for you. While it doesn't need to be a perfect fit, you do need to be comfortable on the bike. All right, now that you're on, let's get moving. When starting to ride and get your balance on the bike, momentum is your best friend. And the best way to start with momentum is a move called the power start. Here's how the power start works. From standing, position your pedal so that it's at an angle raised above the ground. When you're ready to get moving, place your foot onto the pedal and shift your weight forward to create some momentum. From there, you can find your seat and bring your other foot to the pedal as well. And now you've got some momentum to help keep you balanced as you start to pedal. Now, let's talk about safely stopping. To stop, you'll squeeze both brakes evenly and at the same time. Squeezing only the rear brake will slow you down, but might not be enough to stop you all the way. Squeezing only the front brake might cause you to stop abruptly and pitch forward over the handlebars. As you start to slow down, make sure one pedal is at the bottom of the pedal stroke. Put your weight onto that pedal and use your other foot to step forward onto the ground. You'll end up standing over the top tube just like when you started. Make sure you are using the brakes to stop your bike rather than dragging your feet. You want to be at an almost complete stop before you put your feet down. It's good practice to move your pedal into the power start position as soon as you come to a stop. This way, you'll be ready to get moving again as soon as you need to. This is especially helpful while biking with other bikes or while biking in traffic. You'll be ready to go whenever you need to get moving. In the next Yeah, I found that video really, really helpful. And that was also after um, the person's seat was at the proper height, they were able to use their body weight to start the bike, which is actually easier than when if you're sitting on the seat. Um, if you sit on the seat to get started, um, then you're, you're relying on the power of your legs and not your body weight. Um, but once the seat's at the proper height, then I usually start working on having them use their body weight to start the bike and 
it is a little it is quite a bit easier to get started. Kids bikes are actually a lot heavier in comparison to their weight than an adult bike is in comparison to an adult's weight. And so sometimes it's really it is really difficult to get started and get that momentum um, because if you have a 60 80 pound kid and you have a 40 pound bike they're they're trying to push like half of their body weight um, i wouldn't be able to push half of my body weight that easily so um, so sometimes they need a little bit more more effort now if you remember we've only been starting on a slight downhill and once a student has um has done you know has graduated to pedaling and starting and stopping um, then we work on turning um, but but i also have to break it to them that you know they're not going to be able to always be on a slight downhill every time they start their bike so i once they get their confidence up pretty well then i will take them to another part of the parking lot where it's flat it's not a downhill and we work on that and then I'll have them work on a slight, you know, doing starting uh, where the drain is and going backwards, you know, going up the, the down slope. Usually they find that it's a little harder and the bike is, is a lot more wobbly at the beginning. Um, sometimes they'll do um, lots of zigzags before they actually get their forward momentum um, because they're not used to having that, they're used to having a slight slight momentum help with the downslope and now they don't um, so and sometimes if they do have gears on their bike then we'll have to switch the gears so that it's a little bit easier for them to get started on a flat or uphill now once they're you know they're pedaling they're doing all this great stuff um, usually they've just been going in a straight line and starting and stopping i haven't had them turn haven't had them do loops in the parking lot or anything like that um, so now we start practicing turning. Now, if they have had training wheels or were on like a tricycle, um, turning on a bicycle is different than turning on a, a tricycle or a um, bike with training wheels. The only way you can turn on a bike with training wheels or a, a tricycle is to actually turn the handlebars and point the wheel in the direction you want to go. Um, when you're on a bike, we don't really turn the handlebars that much to turn. We lean our body weight more and we turn a little bit. Um, and so the faster you're going, remember faster means you go straight. If you want to turn, you actually have to slow down before the turn, lean into the turn, and start pedaling out of the turn. So slowing down means coasting, not pedaling. Before the turn, slowing down. Sometimes you might even have to put on the brakes a little bit, depending on how sharp a turn it is. Turn and then pedal out of the turn. And that's you know quite a bit different than what they've been doing. What they've been doing is trying to get enough momentum and speed. And so now I'm telling them to slow down so that they can turn and then pedal out of that. And depending on what, how much speed they have, they might just be able to, in the parking lot, they get this nice downslope, they might just be able to go and coast all the way around and then come back without having to pedal too much. The slower you go, the quick, the, the more sharp turns you can make. If you're going really fast, then they're gonna be really wide turns. And I usually tell them to do really wide turns at this point. Um, but this is kind of a new concept for them to, because basically, you know, now that they've, they're pedaling, if they're wobbly, then now they have two choices. They can either come to a stop. And I usually say, well, if there's something in front of you that you're gonna run into, you want to come to a stop, um, not pedal farther to go into it. So, and, and most everybody, uh, when I ask them, okay, if you've got a wall in front of you and you're kind of wobbly, should you continue pedaling or should you stop? And they usually say you should stop. 
Um, but if it's you know wide open and you've got a lot of parking lot, then you should pedal faster. Um, so they, you know, they usually they get that concept pretty well once they've gone in a straight line. So now turning is a little tricky. So then I'll I'll work on them doing lots of right turns and then the opposite direction, lots of left turns. So they get both of those. And so practicing in a big parking lot where they can make lots of different turns um, is really key to feeling confident. And also the concept of being able to coast and then pedal again. I had some students when I would yell coast, they would take their feet off the pedals and then they would have to find the pedals again to be able to pedal. And I'm like, no, coast doesn't mean take your feet off the pedals. It just means don't pedal. So, you know, have to, sometimes I have to have students, you know, pretend that there's glue on their shoes to glue them to the pedals so they don't take their, their feet off too, too quickly. Um, so if I get far enough with students where I have some other skills that I can do with them, then I work on, you know, having them do rough roads. We have some rumble strips in the parking lot for people to test ride over to see how, how the bikes absorb rough roads. And so I'll have them go over that with, with sitting on the seat. And then I'll have them practice um, with them being in their coasting position. So they have to have enough speed before they hit the rumble strips, um, but be in their coasting position and have you know, one pedal all the way down, they're coasting, but then they lift themselves up just a little bit off the seat. Um, and so their legs and arms can be the shock absorbers for the rough. And, and they do notice a big difference between that and having and sit, being on the seat. Sometimes they like, you know, they, they'll, they'll make noises as they're going over the, over the rumble strips because they kind of like that. But um, it, it just depends. But most of the time, we don't usually like riding over really rough stuff. So we'll go over that. Um, then once they have started to be really, really comfortable, then it's time to start moving the seat up to its proper height. Um, there should be a slight bend in the leg. Now this makes it easier to pedal. This makes it so they don't have to lift their second leg quite so far to get it up on the pedal. And it also um, give, gives their full extension of their legs so they get more power in their leg. So there's all sorts of reasons to have the seat at the proper height, um, but I don't put it at the proper height for the beginning because I want them to feel confident that they can put their feet down to stop, stop them from falling. Um, and it's best to gradually raise the seat. Now, once they have the seat at the proper height, they can't really reach the ground very easily. So you can't really start by seating, by being seated on the seat. So now you have to start the same way you did, only they're standing in front of the seat and they're using their weight to push the first pedal down and then they're sliding back on the seat. And so we practice that a couple different ways it's actually the exact opposite of how I want them to stop is where they're, they're standing. They have the starting foot is in the coasting position and the other foot comes down off in the front and then they end up standing in front of the, in front of the seat. Well, this is kind of the opposite where they're going to be pushing off in their right foot. If they're right footed, will be at the bottom and they're, they're going to extend their leg, straighten it so then they can slide back on the seat. And it's, it's, a, it's a bunch of little steps, but it happens like that. Um, so we go over that quite a bit. Um, they will be less wobbly when the seat is at a proper height. They won't have to bend their knees quite so much. Um, and it'll, it'll be a lot easier for them to keep a steady line and have more extension and more power with their first stroke. 
because momentum is your key. Now, one of the things that I do also when they are starting and putting the second foot on the pedal, once they're starting to pedal, you want to make sure that that second foot doesn't have to go all the way up to 12 o'clock. You really want it to be at, like if it's the left foot, that's the second foot. You want that to be at 10 o'clock, even with the down, down tubes. What that means is that the starting foot, when it's coasting and waiting for the other foot to get up, the it needs to go beyond six o'clock at the bottom. It needs to go a little bit farther so that you don't have to lift the other leg quite so far. Um, and that's, that's some, and the reason why is you don't want it at 12 o'clock because if they put their foot down and they're starting to pedal there, there's a 50-50 chance that they're gonna go forward or backwards. And if they go backwards, if it's a coaster brake bike, it's going to stop them, which is not what you want. If it's a non-coaster brake bike, it's just gonna spin backwards and not do anything, not give them forward momentum. You still want forward momentum. So that's, that's a little tricky, um, but it's, it's something that we work on with me standing in front and we, I have them model that on the bike before they actually are riding it. Uh, let's see. So this is what a properly uh, raised seat would be. So the ball of the foot is over the spindle of the pedal. There's a slight bend in the leg and fully seated on the bike. And then the, this leg is, doesn't need to be bent quite so much. If it was, if the seat was a lot lower then that would, that leg would be bent a lot. Let's see. So yeah, so not every start's on a slight downhill. So you have to practice starting in all sorts of things, all sorts of conditions. Um, and also getting ready to start, start and stop again after an intersection, like a stop sign or stop light. And I think, yeah, so I alluded to this earlier. So if they start getting upset or I can't do this or, or whatever, just um, say, okay, try it one more time. We're gonna be done for today. I wanna see the best coast you can give me and then and we'll try it again some other time. Um, and a lot of times, once you've added a new skill, like once I add the pedal, all of a sudden they forgot how to coast. So we have to go back and do coasting again and then add the pedal again. Um, when I add the second pedal, they'll forget how to do stuff. And so we we'll go back to coasting, adding the first pedal, and then I always say, if you're not ready to put the second pedal on, don't worry about it. Just, just keep on doing what you were doing because you need to, to build their confidence so they know that they can do the skills that they used to know how to do. Um, celebrate small victories. I can't emphasize that enough. Make sure that they are um, getting lots of praise for, you know, for everything. When, when they've had a bad coast, say, I know you can do it so much better. I've seen it. Um, sometimes I've had some, some students come back for their second lesson and they knew how to coast and we we're almost ready to add pedals, but ran out of time or they got frustrated or they were tired or whatever. So we, we just stuck with coasting. And so I bring them back or they come back and it's like I, they didn't know how to coast anymore and so I, I usually say where's the little little boy where's the little girl last week that knew how to coast because you knew how to do this and and we'll go we'll go through this um but I had one eight-year-old who just loved to ring her bell on her bike and so that was her motivation when she did a good coast she got to ring the bell. When she did a good stop or a good start, she got to ring the bell. Um, and if it was really, really good, I said, okay, that is, that's worth two bells. You can do two bells. Um, so it was a, a big motivator for her. So you have to find out what the motivator, motivations, um, you know, I'll do 
thumbs up, you know, high fives, virtual high fives. Um, but you, you know, if they only get five, you know, five feet coasting their first time, and you know, that's that's all they've got, then say, this is great. We're gonna see if we can get a little bit farther next time. Um, limit sessions, I would at least at the beginning, especially when they're working on coasting um, and they just have all their body weight on the seat, keep that to like 20 or 30 minutes. Um, and first lessons, when I do lessons, I usually have the first lesson at 30 minutes, unless it's going really well. If they've gotten coasting within the first 20 minutes, then I'll probably go on to pedals. Um, and I might get pedaling. I might get one, one pedal on, I might get two pedals on, um, and I might go to 45 minutes. Um, but if I can't get them coasting within 20, 20 minutes or so, I know that I'm gonna have diminishing returns because it's, it's hard work and it's, they get tired and they, get, and they can get frustrated and I'd rather have them be excited about it and want to show me how good they can coast the next time rather than say, you know, trying to work through something that they're not gonna get right then. Um, so let's see, what else do I have? Yeah, so if, if they're not doing real well with pushing off with both feet, sometimes I'll do the walking where they're walking. And, and I tell them the story about, um, you know, a long time ago when bikes were first built, they didn't have pedals. All they were were a frame and two wheels and handlebars and people just walked and ran. And that's what we turned your bike into is, you know, we went back in time. Um, and so a lot of times uh, some other instructors will do just the walking. We'll do walking and trying to lift your feet longer between each step. And then if you have a, a bigger downhill, then that could speed get some more speed, more momentum, which is great. If it's too big of a downhill, they get scared. So you, it's, you know, it doesn't need to be very much of a downhill to get them going. In fact, at BGI, you can't even really tell it's downhill, but once, if they get a good push off, they can, they can get with one push. Um, I can get, of course, I'm way more than, than youth, but I can get one push all the way around the whole entire parking lot and come back almost in one push um, because there's enough of a slight downhill. Um, so I know that they can get enough of a push to get them all the way to the drain if they've got good coasting skills. But we work on, I have, lines in the parking lot. Okay, see if you can get to that line. See if you can get to this next line. And then, you know, if you can get to that next line and keep on going, that's great. Um, so you give them some motivation and some goals to hit. And then I have a whole bunch of additional resources um, in this PowerPoint, which I will share with folks. Um, most of these, a lot of these are, um, already in the PowerPoint that is on the website, but I actually found a couple more um, that I added today. So I will be updating this on the PDF that's on the website, but I'll be sharing this with folks that registered for this. And most of um, the tips that I've used, I've gleaned from others. Um, and then over the, over the winter, I worked with the, um, a board member from the League of American Bicyclists. And he and I um, have put together a booklet for teaching youth how to ride bikes. Um, it's in its final, final version. It's going to get translated into Spanish. And I'm not sure where it's going after that, um, whether it's getting printed as a booklet or be a PDF, um, but I have the final version of that. I don't have the Spanish version yet, 
Um, but I'm excited about that, that that will be available and I'll be able to also share that with folks. And then we're going to um, then do one based on for adults based on the same steps. These steps work well for any age. I've used them for four and a half year olds. I use them for teenagers. I've used them for nine year olds. I've used them for adults. Um, and so it's, you know, basically turning, turning their bike or a bike into a balance bike and working on the balancing skills first and then adding, adding the other skills. Um, now I usually get, like I said earlier, I think, um, I usually get the hard cases. I don't, because if a parent, if it was easy for them to teach their child, they wouldn't be looking for somebody to teach their child how to ride a bike. Um, so I usually get a lot of the harder cases. And I can't say that I am successful all the time. A lot of it has to do with the motivation of the student and how fearless they are and how patient or impatient they get. Sometimes they get too frustrated and don't don't want to come back or the parents get too frustrated because it's taking too long. Um, one thing that you have to be um, when you're teaching somebody how to ride a bike, it's a physical skill that is, is actually pretty complicated and it takes a while for someone to assimilate it in their brain. And so they really need a lot of positive reinforcement and a lot of patience. It's not necessarily going to happen in one session or two sessions or even five sessions. People, people ask me, well, how many sessions um, will my child need or will, will I need to learn how to ride a bike? And I say, I never know until I start working with someone. Some people pick it up right away and some people it takes you know, several lessons for them to just be able to coast 10 feet. So it really, you know, it really, really depends on the student. Um, but it's been, uh, it's one of the most rewarding things that I get to do as part of my, my job. And I'm excited that I'm getting this booklet. We're getting this booklet um, published in some form so that we can share it with, with others and hopefully get other people so they can, can teach lots of kids and adults how to ride bikes. And then I've got additional videos. So once somebody has learned how to ride a bike, then there's some videos and resources to develop more handling skills. And the, these are all based on, or are all youth based games and, and activities to help their handling skills. Um, let's see. And I think that's all. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And so I did tons of talking and hopefully um, all of you found some information. And if you have any questions you would like to ask, now would be a good time to do that. I do have a question. Yes. I noticed through this entire presentation, there were no training wheels. Yes, I, I do not use training wheels. Training wheels, um, similar to tricycles, uh, do not teach balance. And so they teach pedaling. But once, um, once you take the training wheels off, it's like a totally different vehicle that the child is on because how they learned how to steer doesn't work when you take the training wheels off and how they learned how to stop doesn't work when you take the training wheels off because the training wheel bike can be stopped and they can have both feet on the pedals and it's not going to fall over and that's not the case with a regular you know when you don't have training wheels do you believe it's it's better for them to get used to a bike with training wheels first or no, does it matter? No, I would, I prefer strider bikes 
where they get the balance first and then add petals after that. Because once they have once they have balance, um, that that is really the key okay. thing. Thank you. I just had BGI put training wheels on her bike. Just oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, if if I could rule the world, I would I would get rid of training wheels. <laughs> um, they they teach they teach how to pedal, but they don't teach how to balance. Balance, yeah. And and so what I usually get as students are the parents who oh I you know they can ride really well with training wheels and we took them off and now they can't ride. And that's because it's a totally different feel. They haven't felt balance. They don't feel balanced with training wheels. Okay, so then, helpful, very helpful, thank you. Yeah. So any other, any other questions? All right, so I will, go ahead and end this. And thank you very much for joining. You'll get an email with um, the presentation that's got all the links and stuff. So, and has my contact information. And like I said, I'll, I think I'll be starting bike riding lessons in mid-May, but I have a, I have a backlog of, of people who have wanted them. Um, so I'm excited to, to get them started again, but it's, I have to work out some logistics first to figure out how that's going to work. So, but thank you again for coming and I look for if you have any questions, um, you should have my contact information also from the emails I've sent and I'll be happy to answer any questions as well. Have a good evening. <laughs>